We know from several studies that one in 12 people in South Africa are admitted to hospital due to adverse drug reactions. So that's not the disease, that's the drugs that they're taking. Compare that to um, a population like in Iceland, where it's closer to one in a thousand. So the implications of those adverse reactions are, are, are massive. And you think about how severe these reactions are. Some of the drugs cause um, suicidal ideation, catatonia. Th these are serious effects. Um, and so their hospital stays are extended. So that cost to the country is massive. Um, and we need to think about ways where we can address that issue. So we, we've got this very serious issue and we're in a resource limited country. So we need to be clever about how we address it. We can't keep increasing um, ad nauseum the number of clinical trials to make sure that the drugs that come here suits our population. Um, and the drugs work, let's be clear. We just need to figure out what their dosing should be or figure out best treatment options. It's choose drug B instead of drug A. These are not complicated precision medicine problems. It's actually the low hanging fruit of precision medicine. But how are we gonna do that? So we need to be innovative in the solutions that we come up with. So what kind of solutions can we come up with? So one of the things that we can do is mimic clinical trials in a way, it's not perfect, but we can mimic them in a way where we've got the entire genetic background in cells, specialized liver cells that we can grow in the lab that no one else in the rest of the world has access to. And we can use those, sprinkle drugs, so to speak, and actually measure the metabolism in these cells so that we can try and predict which drugs might need a different dosage, which, which drugs might be better suited to the population. But it's difficult to do that. In the Bioengineering and Integrated Genomics Group, we've actually got some pretty incredible advanced cellular modeling expertise. This is a combination of finding the right individuals in the country that have got the skills, and also really importantly, finding those very special South African scientists who want to come home after doing international experience, which is, which is a really important aspect that we want to enforce here. This is about bringing back the right scientists. And collectively, with, with this group of individuals that I have in my team, and two in particular, we, we know that we've got the expertise to be able to come up with, with those particular solutions. As a team, we're focusing on modeling diseases uh, in a dish. So in, in this instance, what we want to achieve is we want to take an organ and break it down into its subunits and use that to, to model our population. So what we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to isolate hepatocytes, which are the bulk of the um, cells that make up the liver and they're responsible for the majority of the functions of the liver and we want to break those down and then use them for experiments. So if we can draw an analogy that might be a little bit easier for other people to understand is that it's essentially like taking an orange and what we want to do is we want to peel the orange and as well as take away the pith and break down the membrane but then you sit with these beautiful orange segments but not only do we want the orange segment, we also want each individual tiny juice pocket to be separate. So in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're utilizing various techniques and approaches to make sure that each of them can be individually isolated and still beautifully intact. And in the same way, we take the organ like the liver and we use different approaches and different uh, procedures to break down the whole organ into these kind of functional subunits that we can then model in a dish. We were very fortunate um, to be partnered with a group called the African Liver Tissue Biorepository, which has the right combination of all the expertise that you need with this. That's a larger project with a broader idea of, of bringing in samples like this, but one of the things that they were lacking was the cellular expertise to be able to work with these samples, and that's where my team came in. So we became aware of the fact that we would be able to get access to these, these very, very rare and very precious samples of African origin, but no one had ever done it in South Africa. No one had ever done it on the continent. So the combination of finding the right expertise overseas, like Prof Ellis, who was able to virtually talk to my team, take them through the protocol that she does overseas, and then for them to set this up with no other background skill set or no other um, training was what they were able to, to do a year ago. So I'm an expert on hepatocyte isolation. 
and I have been doing this for 30 years. I started in 1992 with uh, rodent hepatocytes and since 1996 I've been working with human hepatocytes. And um, thus far I've done around a thousand isolations. And usually when uh, we train other people in hepatocyte isolation, uh, we take them to the lab and they watch a few procedures. It usually takes quite some time and it's important to see how this is done because all the liver tissues are different. It's very difficult to, to teach. It's not a standard method. When in establishing a hepatocyte isolation, there's a lot that needs to be in place. I mean, obviously you have to have a lab that's set up for um, St sterile conditions. It also needs to be uh, uh, approved for the biosafety level of using human tissue. You need all the equipment uh, from hoods and pumps and all the instruments for for sewing. Uh, it's really important that you have very good collaboration with your surgeons. There's really a lot that needs to uh, be in place and it's very impressive that they've been able to to do all of this um, without having uh, supervision um, in real life that we were able to do this virtually is quite impressive. It, it was it was fascinating actually because we were running around from from hospitals with all these amazing people who wanted to help us do it. We even got donated um, a dis, disused cardiac bypass machine um, to be able to put this together. But it was phenomenal because the um, the amount of of preparation they put together in, in in setting this protocol up, setting up this this technology localization was phenomenal. Given that they'd never done it before. So when Dr. Harrell and Dr. Naidu uh, prepped everything, I remember walking in with the sample the very first time. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first time we did it, it took us 12 hours. On the last one they did, it took us four. That's the level of expertise that they have. I don't know if it's enough, but it's, it's, it's what we got. Yeah. We're gonna go. The localization of technologies, um, especially uh, the localization of cutting edge technologies on the African continent present a number of challenges in terms of infrastructure and expertise in particular. And I think uh, with those challenges, uh, there are also opportunities that are presented. And I think as African scientists, that's something that we do really well, uh, is innovate uh, in the face of adversity. And this project, I think, exemplifies uh, that in terms of the fact that we had two cellular biologists who were handed a cardiac bypass machine um, and a cardiac cardiac bypass kit, which is essentially used uh, by surgeons um, for uh, cardiac bypass surgery. And we had to kind of reinvent uh, these tools uh, to be able to utilize them in order to perfuse and isolate cells uh, from, from a human liver. Um, and that involved uh, MacGyvering uh, the tubing from these kits, uh, putting things together with cable ties, drilling holes in bottles uh, to make them compatible. And I think that uh, the uh, bridging this gap between um, what you, uh, you know you require and what you have to work with uh, is really where innovation uh, occurs. So what does that mean? What do we, what do we have? The samples that we, we, we have sitting in our minus 80 freezer now um, can only be used for research. Um, but what is absolutely critical is that we now have access to primary human hepatocytes, liver cells from liver tissue of African origin that no one else in the rest of the world has. These cell types are the gold standard for drug discovery pipeline, and we're the only ones with, the, with access at the moment to, to, to ones that could actually help develop drugs that are more suited to the African population. When I was challenged by some of my peers with the notion that I would be coming home to do subpar science, I thought to myself, why do we as African scientists always have to be um, overlooked at, at, with our contribution in science? So we've come back and we want to kind of establish a way forward, not only to be involved in the science, but also to lead the global narrative in science and make sure that we're not just a part of the the narrative, but we contribute to writing the narrative. And I think that that's been very important for me in establishing why we want to be involved in such um, critical 
scientific experiments and, and why we want to do that on, on homegrown soil. So localizing the technologies and allowing ourselves to, to put our best foot forward and, and making sure that we have the same opportunities as, as everyone in the rest of the world to put our people in, in the best stead for innovation. What excites me about this project, I think, is uh, impact. And as an organization and as a research group, I think we're really driven um, by the idea of using science to advance the quality of life and to really have an impact uh, in, the, in the lives of, of the people of South Africa and the African continent. Um, and so I think this project is a great example um, of us taking a hold of the global health narrative and being able to give a voice to African research and, and to the African population. Um, especially in terms of if you think of uh, 20 years ago the human genome was sequenced and the fallout from not having enough representation in terms of the African continent and African genetics in that project. When we look to the future and initiatives like the Human Cell Atlas, I think this project is exciting in that it provides us with now an opportunity to be able to say, um, hey, this is us on the African continent, please include us in initiatives like the Human Cell Atlas, which are looking to basically create a Google, Google Maps of the human body and every cell in the human body and to be able to map the disease down to the level of individual organs and individual cells. And I think that's what really excites me is the potential uh, of this project and the work that we've done here to be able to contribute uh, to something greater and uh, receiving greater acknowledgement for, for the African continent.